Hey guys, this is going to be the video for the Sandy Shore ecosystem. Um, we did talk about it in class on uh, April 20th. Um, something to pay attention to um, that we'll mention within the mark scheme of the test question is um, the direction these waves are actually moving. They are coming in and out, um, but then they're also, it looks like they're moving to like the left corner of the screen. Um, and that's just going to be from the prevailing winds or the, the winds in the atmosphere pushing it. So I'll play it real quick and just kind of pay attention to that. Okay, and that's actually going to be um, what the term longshore drift is. It's a water current. Um, currents are the continuous movement of water, and that's they move in a certain direction. That is one of your vocab words from um, end of last semester, I believe. Um, but yeah, so this is going to be the ecosystem of the sandy shore. Um, not only are you going to have waves constantly crashing um, and eroding the substrate, you can see the effects of the erosion at the, the shoreline right there. Um, you're also going to have uh, a lot of tidal influence. Great. Okay, cool. Okay, so we're going to find this actually on page 171. There we go. So the sandy shore. Um, this is a 10 mark question from this year's new syllabus on the um, on the specimen paper. So I definitely wanted to cover that topic. Um, and luckily we are the most familiar with Sandy Shores because that's where we live. All right. All right, so the Sandy Shore ecosystem. Um, this also goes along with the note page that I made for you, it should be on there. Let me just look real fast. Super cool. Love when that happens. If I went paste, there it is. Okay. All right. We got that note page in class, and I am going to post it to your Google Classroom as well. All right. So, just reading right here um, Sandy Shore ecosystems have a unique set of factors for organisms to adapt to. The most challenging factor is going to be using the highlighter and not the eraser. Um, most challenging factor is the ever-shifting porous substrate. You always have changing conditions. Because of the tide, um, the conditions will change two times a day. All right, remember that was the semi-diurnal, where dia means once a day, diurnal, semi-diurnal is twice a day. So two highs and two lows based on our location in relation to the moon and the sun. And then the size of the body of water that's right next to us, of course. All right, um, you've already covered in the biodiversity note page from 4.3 um, that they are very unstable. They're not extreme, it's not a hard place to live in. Um, you know, there's oxygen, there's ample sunlight. And if we compare like an extreme location, like a hydrothermal vent, um, the sandy shore is not that. It's not extreme, but it is very unstable. It is always changing, twice a day even. And the change is pretty great. So you could either be submerged completely in um, under the water, or you could be just exposed to the air. And that air could be cold, it could be hot, windy. Um, and then, you know, if the sun's out, then you are very prone to desiccation, especially with the heat involved too. All right. Um, sandy shores are incredibly unstable. There you go. Um, a single wave or a gust of wind can remove a lot of the fine sand that make up the shore. Um, so it is unstable, which means its conditions will be changing a lot. Um, and again, that's due to the tides two times a day. Um, and uh, and your waves. And biggest thing, the substrate is sandy. And you learned back in first semester 
um, sandy substrates or sand in general, it's easily erodible. Okay, so it is very unstable. It is not extreme. It's It has oxygen. It has sunlight. Um, its temperatures don't fluctuate crazy, like at a hydrothermal vent um, coming right out of the vent that the temperature of the water is like 300 degrees, 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so definitely past boiling. And then um, near the vent, it's the bottom of the ocean. It's extremely cold. It's near freezing. And that will also be something that's going to cause it to be... Um, very extreme in the hydrothermal vent, but here it is not like that. The temperature is pretty stable. Um, it's not acidic and um, there's not heavy metals, anything like that. So, you know, it's not extreme. I think of an extreme place would be a very dangerous place um, where the conditions there are really not commonly suitable for an organism to live there. Um, but in order to live at the sandy shore, it's not just that it, it is a non-extreme place to live it's that it's constantly changing and it actually almost seems like it takes more adaptations to be able to live there than to live at a place like a hydrothermal vent okay sandy shores do not hold on to water well because they are very porous that's when your vocab words and so both water and air easily slip between the grains of sand through the spaces in the substrate. Substrate are, again, is like what you grow upon. We've seen that word numerous times throughout the year. So despite it being well oxygenated, right, because air is able to go through those tiny particles, that's not the problem. Water can go through it too. You know, in a muddy shore, in a muddy shore where you have a lot of silt particles, you don't get gas flowing between, you really don't get a ton of water between it. Um, Water kind of sits so the sediment can settle out and create mud. Um, the sandy shore is well oxygenated, so it's not going to smell like it's rotting. Um, sandy shore can become inundated or like super saturated at high tide. So now you're in a situation where now your habitat, you are completely underwater. Versus at low tide, it could be completely dry. So now it could be, it could be at a risk for desiccation um, for the organisms that live there. So desiccation and then getting washed away are going to be like the biggest threats for those organisms. All right. And in our note page, we can add that at least what we've put on there so far. I do like to just highlight these areas because that's where you're going to be writing. Okay, and something that we um, also identified in class, um, sandy and shore, you have a shifting substrate. And within that substrate, it's very unstable. So the conditions are changing all of the time. All right, so under your abiotic factors, um, most challenging factor, it's not just that they're going to get washed away, but it's that there is a, um, there's always a shifting porous substrate. And shifting meaning it's it's changing. It's not going to be constant. And it's changing for most parts twice a day. There are some areas um, like the Gulf of Mexico that just have um, diurnal tides. But majority of places that are by the ocean are going to have semi-diurnal tides. Okay, and this is going to make it incredibly unstable. It's not extreme. We don't die when we go there. Or we would on like a, at a hydrothermal vent. It's just, it is unstable. Gosh, you guys know me, I have to color it in. Okay. All right, I'm back. Um, there we go. One wave or just one gust of wind can remove a lot of fine sand. They're not boulders, they're not large rocks, like would make up a rocky shore, which are heavy and hard to move. Um, and then again, this, this term, long shore current. So currents are gonna are continuous movement of water in a direction, um, and that moves things up the shore. So if you've ever been at the beach, which you have, I'm sure, <coughs> and um, 
you know, you're in the water at one location and then you come to get out and you're like, where's my stuff? Where am I at? It's, I mean, it's not that your stuff moved. You were pushed up the beach and you're actually just pushed in the direction that the wind is moving. All right. Um, they don't hold water very well. We don't make things made out of sand because water will pour right through it. Um, because they are very, again, porous, the space between the sediment, both water and air will slip between the grains. At high tide, it can be completely saturated, but then at low tide, it can be completely dry. And that is a big change. You'll see a lot of these organisms have the ability to burrow or they're gonna have a shell or some sort of hard exoskeleton on the outside. Okay, go back to that page here. This is a common answer on an exam question. Um, they lack places for attachment. So seaweeds can't survive there. Um, you can't have seagrasses that survive there. So those things have, right, like they have the, there's your rhizome, and there's the roots, and then you have the, the actual, like, organism itself. There's your leaves. And, all right, and then um, remember your seaweeds, they have the, hold fast and then it turns into not a stem but a stipe they have a gas bladder or a pneumatophore Just helps them stay buoyant whenever there's currents moving and keeps them floating in the the sunlit area so they're not on the ground they're not going to get buried with sediment either um and then instead of leaves those things those are called blades all right, the only producers that may occur on a sandy shore are phytoplankton because again, there is no place for, there's no place for attachment and they're brought in by the tides. Like they're not choosing to be there either because as your waves crash, oh, no, there you go. Um, as your waves crash, I mentioned this in class, the waves can also like break open their little cell walls and then they die. Okay, so over here, the only producer that's on the sandy shore. Um, they do not allow for organism attachment. So seaweeds and seagrasses cannot grow there because um, they have the roots and then they also have the hold fast. Can't grow there. And that's going to be the main cause of the low biodiversity, the low amount of uh, different types of organisms that live there. Um, if they don't have a food source, why would they go there? They wouldn't. They absolutely wouldn't. All right. The only producer that can be there is phytoplankton that's brought in by the tides. Back to adaptations. Um, most organisms that deal with these abiotic, so non-living factors, living by living in the substrate rather than on the substrate. Organisms in a sandy shore community, you need to know pretty fast the definition for a community. A community is um, all of the populations in an ecosystem at the same time. And that was a vocab assignment for this past weekend. And then a population, nice arrow. No, I can't, can't deal with it. Population is um, a group of species, this of the same species. 
at a habitat at the same time? Okay, and those are common questions. Just basic state what is meant by questions. Oh, okay. So organisms in the Sandy Shore community tend to be burrowers or in fauna. And in class, I also mentioned the difference between flora and fauna. Flora is like flores, like flowers or plants. So in fauna is going to be, um, or fauna, right? Flora and fauna. Fauna is going to be the animals. If you think about like a baby deer, which is a fawn. Um, the term in is leading to organisms that are going to be living inside of something. And it's not a plant. It's going to be the, the animal. And it's just that organisms that burrow within the substrate. Ghost crabs, cockles, other bivalves, worms, ragworms, and logworms. Um, cockles are mentioned and part of the test question that I did the screen recording for um, this weekend and then posted out to you on, um, on Monday night. Okay, however, there's still biotic factors that will influence them. Oh, before I go on to that, let's answer the abiotic part on this page. So organisms um, have to live in the substrate, not on it, or they would get blown away. All right, and then so they tend to be burrowers or in fauna. I think for your exam, um, easiest way to remember it is burrowers. And why are they burrowers? Um, because there is, uh, oops. There you go, because there is no attachment allowed. No, not an ability to attach, there's nothing to attach to. All right, back. So biotic influences. However, there's still biotic factors that influence these communities. Again, groups of different, um, groups of populations. So groups of different species, groups of populations in the same habitat at the same time, like predation and then competition, because there will be limited organic material there because your organisms cannot photosynthesize. They can't, not that they can't photosynthesize, they can't live there to even begin to photosynthesize. Um, fewer rocks, I mean, there's fewer habitats, and it's not like you're living within an estuary um, or like a mangrove habitat. You can hide within the prop roots or anything like that. Um, you are very exposed in um, living in Florida. I think we've all seen that. We've all been to the beach. Um, there's no places to hide from predators. Um, or shorebirds. And the birds, you know, unless there's going to be a shark there, because um, they are pretty, like, advantageous. They take advantage of any kind of potential situation where they can be the dominant organism. Um, the shorebirds are really what's what's dominating those habitats, which is kind of funny that they're the apex predator. Um, there's also fewer niches on a sandy shore. Um, niches, again, another vocab word that you guys had this weekend. Niches are the organisms Jeez Louise, organisms role in its ecosystem. Um, that word is so common on these exams. Typically it would be the first thing that was taught, but um, the content was kind of flipped this year. Then, but those niches, like that term and organisms role in its ecosystem, if, if it's not role, the, the answer is wrong. That is, very, very, very specific. Um, so niches are kind of like everything that they do. And an example of this is like in a really populated area, everybody's going to have pretty much their own place they go to, um, their own seat, you know, their um, their own job, places that maybe have a high population will have like their own parking spot just so it doesn't cause any issues. And we kind of split ourselves up really well. Um, and there's no overlap, right? We don't let people cut in front of us in line. Like that will kind of cause some competition. Um, from regular biology, whenever you do have competition or you have any sort of niche or, you know, you can't say this on the test, you can say job, but like a job overlap, a role, it's a role. Then the competitive exclusion principle kicks in. And the competitive exclu exclusion principle, and this is something that should be taught in regular bio, 
that no two species can occupy the same niche or role and the same habitat at the same time or else they will compete. And that means that one is one organism, whoever in the competition is gonna have to either leave or be killed. And that's just the, the animal world. And, you know, we kind of feel this way if though, you know, you don't have assigned seats in class or even like in the lunchroom, but you've been sitting there for a while, you've kind of developed that area. Um, and if somebody kind of goes and takes your seat, you're like, no, what? You know, you're not gonna like kill them or make them leave, but that does cause a little bit of, um, little bit of anxiety for, for us and for organisms it's the same way. In a coral reef, there's so many organisms, right? It's the most biodiverse ecosystem. Um, and that's gonna be because the conditions are wonderful, right? The conditions are not extreme and it's very stable. Coral reefs are always gonna be a nice place and they're gonna um, allow a lot of organisms to be able to live there successfully. However, and that's, there's also a lot of organic material being synthesized. However, because there's so many organisms, they have developed specific roles and you must not overlap those. So you don't see any like um, clownfish or anemone fish invading another anemone fish's anemone. You know, that's not, that's not gonna be appropriate for them. And then they will fight with each other. Um, you could have competition between mates and that would be that intra competition. Intra, competition that's with the same species so keep the a's together where inter competition is between different species um in an area that maybe there was only like 100 kids in the school right we split up those three lunches you got 33.3 kids in each lunch and you could maybe take your own table there wouldn't be so much competition about where we're going to sit where we're going to sit or any sort of overlap there it wouldn't matter it wouldn't matter, but when the population is very high, you will have very specific niches. Um, you'll have a lot of them, you'll have to, or else those organisms wouldn't live there, but they're very specified and there won't be any overlap. Um, you know, taking somebody's parking spot, that's not gonna happen. And that's actually why we typically have like our own designated parking spots, but it causes competition. And so niches are gonna be very high. You'll have very specific and a lot of niches where you have a lot of productivity from your producers, and then therefore it's gonna be a lot of organisms that live there. Niches will be low and there won't be many of them and they will be more generalized. It won't be so specific when the biodiversity is low, but there's fewer, fewer niches. So, you know, these, you know, sand fleas or any sort of crabs or little burrowing um, shelled organisms, it's not a problem if they move up and down the shoreline. There, nobody, no other organism is going to be like, "Hey, you're burrowing into my hole." It's not a problem. There's so much space, and you have to have a specific kind of adaptation to even be able to live here. So the niche problem, then, and the competition there, it's not going to be because of habitats, and it's not be, going to be because of mates. Um, their competition is really going to be because there's not enough food sources. And that's also what's going to cause them to have less niches. So there are fewer niches, fewer roles. Organisms aren't going to want to live there. There's really nothing to eat. So what's the point? Why fight for a space in an area that is not really beneficial for other organisms? Who are you going to fight with? It won't matter. Um, this is due to the re um, reduced number of food sources. Photosynthesis. Not going to be happening too much on a sandy shore because of the lack of attachment on their substrate. The primary food source on a sandy shore is plankton. And then they can eat any sort of dead little organic material that's gonna wash in with the tide. Um, a lot of your sandy shores are crabs or different kinds of crustaceans. They are detritivores. Vor means lover of, and detritus is dead things. So they're eating like leftover, like particulates from somebody else's meal, little pieces of like, tissue from another organism, like a crab would. Um, and they can get any kind of little organic material or whatever between grains of sand um, as they're burrowing down. But because there is a lack of food sources, this is gonna cause competition between those species that don't live in there, okay? And so it's these challenges, the lack of food sources, and lack of food sources, again, because there's no attachment for producers to attach to, there's no substrate for producers to attach to. So there's not gonna be organic material. 
if your first trophic level is going to be low in organic material, the rest of the trophic levels will also be low. So this is why they're going to have a very low biodiversity compared to rocky shores. Okay, they have to have specific adaptations. And again, these adaptations, they, um, the rest of this text will go through it. Um, they can, they burrow. Um, again, another worm burrowing. You can see that worm right there. And you can also see that it made this. I actually saw that a lot in um, Mexico. And again, more burrowing. Okay. Finish that note page. So biotic factors, predation. Um, predation can be high. due to a decrease or low hiding places. There's no rocks or little crevices to go to. Competition can be high due to a decrease in organic material. And we see this with the seabirds. If you drop any kind of piece of, um, you know, like food or snack that you have, they're like gonna jump you for it. They are very, very quick to get all over that um, and compete with each other for it too. Biodiversity is low. So the different, the different species that live there is low. Um, their genetic, um, their genetic alleles or the genetic diversity was probably going to be pretty low. You don't have to, you only have to have like a couple different adaptations to be able to live there. All right, and so they do have some adaptations for them to help there. Their body shape, if you consider like a, a, a shelled organism or a crab or um, a, a sea star or a sand dollar, their body shape is pretty flat. And it's flat like dorsally. Remember dorsal is back of. So if you think of like your sand dollar. They're pretty flat. Um, their coloration, they are, eight, they are similar to their substrate. I'm gonna look up how to spell camouflage because gosh, I get it wrong like every time. Okay, coloration is gonna be similar to their substrate and that's gonna help with camouflage. There's the U. All right, and then we can answer the test question. So this one at the top, seven marks. And we are gonna describe the features on a sandy shore ecosystem. Command word describe, that means what? Where explain is how or why. And outline, which means you can just give like basic statements and, and bullet, although you can bullet almost all of this, how literally upset explain how, but how the organisms that live there are adapted to cope with the abiotic factors in this environment. So it's non-living factors. Um, the change in, you know, water amount, the, the wind erosion, the longshore drift, um, not being able to burrow, or I'm sorry, not being able to attach. Okay, so the first way I'm going to answer this, I'm going to mention the abiotic features that are there, and then we can discuss out the adaptations for them. All right. So, SS, Sandy Shore, it's unstable. All right, and then I'm just going to indent a little bit because this is leading to the next one. So, like, why? Easily moves. Say it's easily erodible. So it's wind erosion, um, water erosion, and then specifically that term that was on the note page, longshore drift. So we I put it on there at the end of the day, but we did write it on there in class. 
longshore drift is one of the things that will move the sand. So we say prone to or subject to longshore drift. Um, the particles. So also like why it, it's going to be easily movable. Small sand particles. It's going to create a porous, goodness gracious, not again. I'm sure it's still going to send those. Um, porous substrate. Um, within that mark, we could say it's free draining. Um, can dry out easily. That also can go in that mark, can dry out easily. And because it's a poor substrate and there's small sand particles and it is subject to erosion, it um, does not allow for attachment. So no substrate, sand is not for attachment. Hard surfaces are for attachment. Okay, and then another thing that they mention, we're like on a rocky shore, you can have like kind of a flat area all the way to the vertical cliffs. Um, on the sandy shore, you do have um, gentle or very like low slopes. Not completely flat, like you would call mud flat. I'll just get rid of that, but like low slopes. Okay, so these are gonna be specifically for the abiotic factors. And then, um, how do they try to adapt to that? Put that in a different color. Okay. Um, let's start with um, yeah, the biotics and like, and then how they're going to adapt to that. Um, and it's, it is because of these abiotic factors that there will be low productivity. Um, so low food availability, et cetera. And I'm going to add that in there. Okay. So all of these will cause, all of them will cause, that's what the arrow is going to be for, um, low productivity. Remember, productivity is a rate. That is a common question that's on these exams. It's also on your practice test. It is the rate of organic material production. And you measure it in kilograms, so the amount in an area in a time, or the rate of photosynthesis. Okay, because there's low productivity, that means there's gonna be low food availability. Because of low food availability, there's low biodiversity. No organisms are gonna wanna live there, not many. The organisms that live there are like the cleanup. Like, we'll just eat the scraps. Because biodiversity is so low, you're not gonna have to have very specific niches. So you're gonna have wide ecological niches. Niches are an organism's role in its environment. Okay, and so then how are they gonna be able to adapt? Like what are some of their adaptations? All right, so they will burrow. for protection from predators um, or exposure to temperature 
or retaining moisture so they don't dry out. Um, another thing that we wrote, they are also flattened. You don't have to include what's in the parentheses, but like they're flattened like on their backs, right? They're not tall up and down. They're not circular. Um, yeah, they're flattened like top down. So dorsally or ventrally. And how does that help? It does assist in burrowing. You're not having to dig a very deep hole for them. They can kind of flatten themselves out there. Like when you ask someone to bury you in the sand, if you do, or you did when you were a kid, you're not getting buried, like, you know, from your feet to your head. You lay yourself down flat. Um, and then, again, for protection, we also have another mark. Let's give another bullet. Camouflage. Dude, I spelled it right. Let's go. And then um, ways that they can adapt, again, to, like, the, the waves or, or your constant moving of uh, the currents. Um, and I will just... You slip it over right here. I don't know. I'll put it right here. There's only this mark and one more left. So they'll um, enter water column um, when the top to feed when the tide is in because it's bringing food. That's the way they're going to get their organic material. And then one more, which I will ultimately end up like, you know, it does, no, never mind. I was going to say, well, erase it, but it's a tablet. Um, they can migrate up and down the beach with the tide. Okay, and these are all of their adaptations. And specifically these ones here. These are like the, um, effect of the biotic factors or the abiotic factors. Awesome. All right. Thanks for watching.